thank you for coming out tonight to the Interval at Long Now. We're so happy to have you here. Uh, this is, I believe, the 52nd talk we've given and we've done in this series, over just over two years, 52 talks. All of them sellouts like this, so thank you so much for responding and, and coming out and, and being a part of this. So, uh, give yourselves a round of applause. Uh, We're, we're, we're really excited um, at the great reception this series uh, has been. And, and we're also excited, this is another talk in our kind of series within the series with CASBIS, the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences uh, from Stanford, uh, a wonderful program. These are always great talks that uh, bring scholars from around the world. Big round of applause, please, for Rose. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming and tearing yourself away from the Republican uh, National <laughs> Convention tonight. Uh, I can't promise much, except I can promise none of this is plagiarized, uh, because the only person I could plagiarize it from is myself. Um, I would um, also like to show real appreciation to my two fellow fellows, Andrew and uh, Jamie, who um, just finished these CASBIS fellowship with me. Um, some of you were probably at Andrew's talk last month, um, so I'm really grateful to them for um, coming and um, showing support. Um, so uh, what I want to talk to you about tonight is the genetics of politics, which is really um, a, um, a body of work that we've been developing over the last decade or so that's at the intersection of political science, uh, psychology, evolutionary psychology in particular, and behavior genetics. Um, most, but not all, of this work comes by looking at twins and the difference between identical twins and fraternal twins. And um, by complicated mathematical procedures, um, you can determine which aspects of behavior are genetic, which come from common environment, like schools or homes or families, and which come from unique environment, which happens only to one person. Although those things can also be biological, like the in utero environment is a, is a unique environmental thing. Um, just so you have a sense, I've um, done a lot of work in a variety of different areas, which I try to integrate in the work that we've been doing on um, uh, genetics and politics. Um, so a lot of this is combined, and um, I'm happy if any of you are particularly interested in any of these topics uh, to take questions on them um, at the end. But what I want to do is take you on a bit of a, a story about the intersection of um, genetics and politics, and the way that genetics um, influences complex social and political behaviors. Um, I should say at the outset that most of this work has been done in concert with my primary collaborator, uh, Pete Hatami, who's at Penn State. Um, and along with a few other people, we've been working on this stuff, as I say, for the last decade. The reason this is unusual is that for the last 50 or 60 years, since people started thinking about the origins of political ideology and political party identification in a systematic way, the story was always that this was socialized. It's something that you learn uh, at the knee of your parent growing up, and you know your parent is a Republican, and you want your parent to love you, and so you become a Republican, so your parent will love you. Or that it's something you learned in the schools or from your peer networks. You know, you go to Bennington and you become more liberal or whatever. Um, but in fact, it, it turns out that it's a, it's a much more complicated story. It's not that the story about socialization is wrong. It's absolutely right. It's just half of the story. And the other half is what happens in our biology and in our evolutionary history. And that's what we've been trying to uncover. It's early days, so a lot of this is uh, speculative, but um, I want to take you on a little bit of a journey of um, how we've been investigating this. So uh, one of the early studies that um, we did last two years ago, I guess now, um, looked at um, the influence of smell on attraction. Now, the story is a little bit complicated, and we'll come back to uh, more of it later. Um, but the reason this is important is that if some part of your politics is genetic, then the most important decision you make in your child's um, political ideology is who you mate with, right? Because your genes and their genes join together to have children who um, have particular kinds of political biases that are influenced by um, your genetic propensities. But how do you know, 
right? How do you know, even when you ask people, maybe they don't know, maybe they're lying to you, how do you actually know um, in an automatic, immediate way what somebody else's ideology is? And for um, certain reasons, we speculated that it had to do with smell, and specifically pheromones. This um, shows you why we thought this. So this is a, um, a slide where you basically can see the extent to which certain uh, chromosomes are associated. And when it's above, you know, three times 10 to the eighth, where you see it's significant, those are likely to occur not just by chance, right? That it happens in a systematic way. And the ones that you'll see, this is political ideology, by the way. We're looking at the genes that are associated with political ideology. This is one of them. And what you'll see is that these are the things that are, um, the, the chromosomes that are associated with this are those that are related to smell, that are related to olfaction and pheromonal strains. So we have these intuitions um, based on these genome-wide analyses that maybe smell had something to do with um, the way that people uh, were able to automatically determine uh, unconsciously, this is not a conscious process, the political ideology of um, people that they might get involved with. So we did a study where we looked at um, facial and body, um, both sound, we, did, we taped people's voices saying, hi, how are you? We manipulated them, so half of them were just neutral, hi, how are you? Half of them were seductive, like, hi, how are you? Um, and um, we um, uh, also took pictures of people. And most importantly, we did a paradigm based on the wet t-shirt test, although we didn't actually use t-shirts. We had people um, have um, gauze pads under their underarms for a day, and there's a particular protocol. They have to wash their hair. They have to wash their body. They wear it for 24 hours. They can exercise, but there are certain foods they can't eat. They can't be around candles and other things that smell. Um, specifically, you can't sleep with another person or an animal that night. You kind of can't believe people will do this for 25 bucks, but they do. Um, <laughs> And uh, then they come in, you give it to, you know, they give you the, the pads the next day. And then what you do is you freeze them and you slice them up and you do um, various things. And then you bring in another group of people and you have them smell them. And you ask those people, well, what does this smell like to you? Is this a trustworthy smell? Is this somebody that you think is warm? Is it somebody you think is competent? Is it somebody blah, 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 blah. So what's interesting about it is... There's absolutely no correlation on all these things like, is this person warm? Are they competent? Are they trustworthy? There's no correlation. We ask people, can you tell if this is a liberal or a conservative? Can't tell at all. But you ask them, do you like this smell? Are you attracted to this smell? Do you want to sleep with this smell? And it completely predicts whether or not that person's ideology matches their own. They can't tell you consciously, but the attraction is there. So we had 190 people. We used various pictures. Uh, we had these voice samples. By the way, the voice stuff um, was interesting. We didn't get any findings by whether or not the voices were seductive or neutral, but what we did get are asymmetries by conservatives and liberals. So liberals really don't like the sound of conservative voices, um, and conservatives really don't like the smell of liberals. <laughs> and this is, a, this is the slide that shows this. Um, the, this is conservatives smelling conservatives, liberals smelling liberals. The M and F have to do with um, males and females. Um, so, and it's a little backwards, right? So this one is males smelling females, males smelling males, females smelling. So the people who like each other smell the least are women like each other smells the least. This was a heterosexual sample, I should say. Um, so you can see that there's, there's differences in it. And there are asymmetries. Um, but these are all statistically significant differences where you can see that um, these are related to um, people's automatic, you know, unconscious inference about um, how these things work. The study was very interesting when I did it because the first day I was, we were really not sure it was going to work, and we opened up the vial, and I gave it to my lab manager, and she smelled it, and she's like, yeah, it's okay, because we were kind of like, is this going to gross people out? Um, and so she brought in her boyfriend and said, smell this, and he smelt it and he threw up. Like I had to do this Vegas thing on him to stop him from throwing up. And he's like, that is rancid. And I smelled it and I'm like, it's not rancid. She smelled it. She's like, it's not rancid. And I was like, this study is so going to work. Um, <laughs> so then on the last day, it was really wild because there was um, a woman who came in. It was the last day. Which is a, I, I ran um, the subjects on the last day, and she was about the fourth to the last person who came in, and she came in and she said, 
what are you going to do with the vials when you're done? And I said, I'm going to slice them up, I'm going to put it in the freezer, and I'm going to do a chromatome analysis. And she's like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, I am sure. And she said, um, can I have one of them? Do you need all of them? And I said, yes, I need all of them. What are you talking about? And she's like, I want to take it home with me. <laughs> so it was this vial. I still remember. It was 190. That was the number of the subject. So immediately after that, she leaves. She's all disappointed. She's mad at me. And immediately afterwards, this guy comes in, and he's like, one of your samples is rancid, dude. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, I almost wrecked. Like, I almost wrecked your study because I was going to throw up all over the floor. I said, which one is it? 190. So I went and looked, and it was exactly what you'd expect. It was a conservative guy, conservative woman, and liberal guy, right? So it was completely predictable. Um, and it surprised even me, the strength of it. But that's an anecdote, but the, the data supported it. So the question is, is there a real difference between people on the right and the left that is embodied, right, that is physically in one's um, constitution? So I'm going to um, show you some pictures, and you can decide whether or not you think there's physiological differences on average in the body language of some of these people. These are from Britain, Denmark, United States, right? So the argument that we're making is, yeah, there are real differences. And the differences are more than skin deep, um, that they actually take place in the brain activity. Um, this is a study that a colleague of mine, Darren Schreiber, did um, where he looked at um, differences in brain activity in a risk task where people had to actually bet on money in a gambling game. And he was able to isolate which parts of their brain were active and showing that differences between activation in different um, parts of the brain in this risk task could predict whether people voted for the Democrat or the Republican Party better than asking them their political party identification. Now that's remarkable because asking people their political party identification is the gold standard for finding out people's political ideology. You ask them, right, and they tell you, and it turns out that's not as good as predicting how they'll vote as brain activation patterns. So the question is, what's going on here, right? Well, and there's, we have some indications about what's going on. One of the things that's going on is that liberals and conservatives really differ in their physiological reactivity. This is based on a series of studies that John Hibbing and John Alford ran at the University of Nebraska. Some of you may have seen the gig that John Stewart did on this particular study. You hook people up on their fingers and they get galvanic skin responses based on their sweat to how activated they are to particular stimuli. There's another version of this where you do it with eye blinks and you see how fast and hard people blink their eyes when they see a stimulus. And then what you do is you look at you show them threatening stimuli, you show them neutral stimuli, sometimes you show them um, happy stimuli. So what does this look like? It looks like this. This is one of the threatening stimuli, right? And you show this to people and what you find is that people who are politically conservative are much more reactive to this than people who are liberal. Who are liberal are sort of like, oh, it looks like a fuzzy spider, it's kind of cool, isn't that interesting how the eye is reacting, right? And liberals are like, ah! you know, I mean, conservatives are ah, really scared, right? Um, if you saw the Republican convention yesterday, masterful thing, like, can you be scared? No, you should be even more scared than you are. No, you should be even more scared than that, right? I mean, there's, there's these real narratives that go along with it. <laughs> so the question is, in a lot of um, studies in political ideology, especially work that looks at democracy and the importance of debate in democracy, you know, the problem isn't that you and I... Um, disagree, we just need to come up with a common compromise interpretation. And the argument that I would make is that that's not actually true. We don't differ on interpretation, we differ on perception. We actually see different things, and we hear different things. And we see and hear different things in a top-down way that's orchestrated by our political ideology. Our political ideology determines what it is we see and what it is that we hear. For example, this is an eye tracking study. You just saw this stimuli, right? Threatening stimuli. The blue dots show you that when you show this image to a liberal, that's where a liberal looks. And the red dots are where conservatives look. Oops. That one. <laughs> I'll get to the next one in a minute. So what do you notice about this? What are the liberals looking at? Eyes. Liberals love to look at eyes. If you ever do an eye tracking study, 
Liberals look at eyes so much you can use it as like the calibrating mechanism. They're all about the eyes, right? And conservatives, they're looking at the threat. So they're not actually looking at the person's reactivity to the threat, they're just looking at the threat. Whereas the liberals are saying, well, does this person actually consider this a threat or not? Right? They're actually having disagreements about the literal perception of the event. And we did this across many domains. So we did it across threatening domains, we did it across patriotic domains, we did it across disgusting domains, we showed people pictures of shit, um, we showed people pictures of vomit, those are always real winners. But we also show people sexual images. That's what this one is. And again, here you'll see differences in liberals and conservatives, right? So conservatives say that liberals are the ones who are really, you know, into the sex. Well, it looks to me like the conservatives are the ones who are all about, you know, the boobs and the, and the lip lock, right? What are liberals looking at? Wow, doesn't she have totally great jewelry? I just, like, am so into her jewelry. And, like, her hair, it's just so awesome, right? So it's all about adornment, right? They're very, very different um, attentional features. By the way, you can run these eye-tracking studies looking at the differences between men and women, and they're even more amusing. <laughs> so this is, um, this is, again, an eye-tracking study. The darker color, so the closer you get to red, is where there's more attention on the region of interest. So what you'll notice here is there's various attention. So what, what's really curious to me about this picture is um, my advisor, Phil Zimbardo, always taught me to be my own first subject always. So I always run myself as my first subject. And then I always end up being an outlier, and so I'm completely not instructive for other people. So when I looked at this study, the thing that I fixated on was the gun. And you'll know, like, nobody's paying attention to the gun. It's really sort of interesting. Um, but you'll see differential attention. So what the conservatives are paying attention to are the emblems of authority, the patches about, I'm a cop, right? Like, I'm, I'm the law and order. Whereas what liberals are paying attention to is the person getting the beat down. And to a certain degree, um, liberals are also paying attention, you, I didn't circle it, but to the, the cane. Like, this is a disabled person, right? Not a single conservative paid any attention at all to the cane. So there's real differences in what people are paying attention to. It's not, again, just an issue of interpretation. It's an issue of perception. Why is this important? This is important because it can predict important political choices that people make about policy issues. So in the image that I just showed you, which is this same image, you can actually look at how liberals and conservatives respond differently. And then the other thing we manipulated was the story we told. There was a 30-second narrative. So in some of the narratives, we called it a beatdown, and in some of the other narratives, we called it an arrest. And you'll notice that conservatives don't change at all how they look at the image based on the narration, but liberals completely change the way that they think about it um, when you call it a beatdown versus... Um, an arrest. Why is this important? Because different people respond to different stimuli differently. So in other words, some people are much more visual and some people are much more auditory. Here you see in this particular instance that the reactivity on that is really, the auditory reactivity is liberal. In this, which is a different image of a woman looking at a coffin, um, uh, where we said that he died in combat versus he was a looter, you'll see that the difference in perception changes as a function of somebody being conservative. Again, these are things that you can run not just with liberals and conservatives, but with other categorizations as well. Um, one, like when we run these um, uh, with men versus women, they're always really funny because the men never pay attention to the narration. It's all about the, it's all about the image. Um, but in these, it's, it's reactive based on whether or not um, people are liberal or conservative and how they look at the image. Similarly, in the sex differences one, we had an image. You saw the one with um, Madonna and Britney Spears. You can see um, the amount of time they spend looking at the necklace. In the other one, it's a, story of a, it's a picture of a soldier holding an injured child. Um, and you can look at differences here. I just wanted to show you how you can divide it up by sex differences, um, that there's differences in men and women looking at the child's face versus the child's body. So these aren't just ideological things. You can also look at um, sex differences as well, although we've been primarily interested in the ideological differences. 
Um, again, these help you predict policy um, preferences. So we have people look at certain images and then find out, you know, ask people, um, did we make a mistake sending troops into Iraq? Or do you think the U.S., this was done a little while ago, do you think the U.S. can or will win the war in Iraq? Um, and you can predict people's response to that policy question based on how much time they spend looking at particular parts of the image. So if they're spending a lot of attention looking at the flag, you can see that that predicts their answer to whether or not um, uh, they think that the U.S. made a mistake in entering the war in Iraq and so on. And we've done numerous ones of these, about 40 of them, and they end up being pretty consistent. So there are particular categories of things that people care about. Um, and you can look at this, again, by liberal or conservative. Here I'm just listing some of the, oops, some of the preferences um, of people that are particularly concerned with protection, which on average tend to be people on the right of the political spectrum. Um, none of these constellations should surprise people uh, who, for example, have been watching the Republican National Convention. So what does this have to do with genes? Um, there was a report a while ago, liberals, you know, uh, researchers find the liberal gene. That is beyond ridiculous, right? Why is it ridiculous? It's ridiculous for several important reasons. First and most importantly, there is no such thing, right? <laughs> Why is there no such thing? Why can there never be any such thing? Because genes aren't that simple. There are multiple genes, there are multiple pathways, these things are multifactorial, they work in complicated interaction with environmental factors, so you're never going to find one single thing that's going to help you understand the liberal gene or the conservative gene. These things are very complex and it's not just physiology, it's not just genetics, but it's also not just environment, they work together. What does that mean? It means that DNA isn't your destiny, genes contribute to these political outcomes, but they're not the only thing that matters. The environmental factors also matter quite a bit. So to come back to where I started, why should all of this genetic stuff matter with like how you smell people and so on? And it has a lot to do with assortative mating. Assortative mating means people mate, and here I really do mean like have sex and have children with. I don't mean like fall in love with and get married, right? I'm really talking about the genetic piece. Um, with people who are like them. So you say, what does that mean? Well, it's a complicated pathway, right? Um, that involves environment, that involves um, genetics, that involves development over time, leading to uh, particular and, and showing individual physiology that leads to particular behavior. In this case, the behavior that we care about is political ideology. But here I'm talking right, right here in this developmental path about individual DNA, which is determined by your parents mating and meeting meeting and mating. So how does this work? Well, David Buss, who's a really brilliant evolutionary psychologist, did studies a while ago where he looked at the characteristics that are preferred uh, over time by men and women in their partners that they're having children with. You'll see quite a bit of overlap and also some things that are distinct. But the question is, you'll notice none of those are political, right? Do you see anyone saying, what I really want to marry is a Democrat? Right? What I really want to have kids with is, a, is, you know, a Republican. People don't know that about themselves. So that's why I'm showing you this slide. People really don't know themselves very well, right? So are we really selecting each other on politics? Well, one of the things we know is that it's not the case that you become more similar over the time that people are together. It's that you start with people who are similar and you stay similar. It's not the case that you start divergent and you converge over time. You can see people starting different and converging over time in pictures of what people look like. Like if you show people who've been married for 40 years, they look more like brothers and sisters, mostly because they probably mimic each other's facial expressions a lot. I hate you. Um, <laughs> um, but, the, but on politics, it stays the same, right? Okay, so if you know that it's not convergence and it's assortation, how are people finding each other if they don't know that that's what they're looking for? Well, if you look at, these are long-term people. So these are people who've been married, had kids longer than 30 years. So I'm not including people who like divorce it, you know, seven years in. There's only three things that people mate on long-term that are more than would be expected by random chance. Religion, which we know is socially homogamous, meaning 
It's a socialized thing that comes from the social networks you're in. Political ideology and drinking frequency. Everything else is an illusion. It's totally <laughs> random. You like to walk on the beach, you like to eat dinner, you like to go to the movies, it's all bullshit, right? <laughs> Religion, politics, and drinking. The rest of it, forget about it. <laughs> True story. Not that I'm a cynic. Okay, so we looked at it a little deeper and we say, okay, is that really all that's going on? All these other things about religion, maybe it's really that you're not, mar you know, you're not mating with your ideal body type. That ends up not working out at all until my colleague said to me, well, of course, Rose, nobody has sex with who they have sex with. They have sex with their fantasies. It doesn't really matter who you're with. I said, ah. Oh. So <laughs> what does matter, though, is race. And if you don't see that by looking at the difference between the Democratic and Republican national conventions, it's the most obvious thing. I looked out at the convention last night. There's two black people. That's it, right? So there is a difference. So you do get assortative date, um, dating differences where conservatives and liberals, that's the only thing that they're significant, statistically significantly different with. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that conservatives, on average, in a statistically significant way, are much more likely to want to... Um, mate with somebody within their own race. This isn't just white people. It's black people, it's Asians, it's, you know, Latinos, whatever. But who's really driving that, if you look at it, is white men. White men don't want to have kids with somebody who's not a white woman, right? Um, you get much more willingness and fluidity around other groups. So although it's a statistical difference by um, political ideology, it's really being driven uh, by white men not wanting to um, mate outside their racial background. Why does this matter? Why this matters is that if you run sim simulations, if you buy my argument that part of political ideology is really uh, genetically entrenched, then what that means is that if people are mating on the basis of political ideology, over time you're going to get a po more politically polarized population. Right? You're going to get liberals with liberals, conservatives with co conservatives. You're going to get fewer people in the middle. And this is what this simulation shows, is that Across 50 years, you're going to get a more politically polarized population. And you say to me, well, okay, but like, why wasn't this true 100 years ago? Why it was different 100 years ago is that, by and large, rich men married beautiful women who didn't tend to go to college and who didn't tend to be allowed to have political attitudes of their own, right? And so it wasn't the thing that was being selected for. Now, based on, you know, um, the last two series of college classes that have come out of Brown, the number one thing that men care about in saying what they want in somebody that they're going to have kids with is earning power, right? So it's very different. It's not, but it also means you're in the same uh, political and social milieu, so you actually know what the person's ideology is and so on. But maybe you don't know what the person's political ideology is. So this was a study that we did on an online dating platform. I can't tell you which one. Um, where we um, randomly selected 313 zip codes. And we took the first five profiles of men, the first five profiles of women. I actually personally read through 5,000 of them. It was the most depressing thing I've ever done in my entire life. <laughs> Every woman had a picture of herself like this. She was like, I'm done playing games. What I really want is somebody who's going to take care of me and pay for my life, right? And every man was like, what I really want is a smoking hot chick who's going to clean the toilet and bring me beer while I sit around and watch the game. Like, it was just unbelievably depressing, <laughs> right? And then after a while, you know, you've heard, you're 2,000 in, and you're like, oh, that guy in Massachusetts, he'd be really great with that woman in Arizona. <laughs> I started sending notes to people. <laughs> but notice, people don't know that they're matching on politics. They say, oh, I really care about movies and videos, and we have all these interests in common, and I like to travel, and I like to eat out, and I like to walk on the beach. And the ability of that to predict your ability to have children that you can raise to reproductive success is zero. Zero, right? What's really predicting it? People aren't even selecting on it. They don't know. So what's happening? If we know that these long-term mates are people who share their political ideology, but people don't know that that's what they're selecting on, how the hell do they find each other? Well, they find each other on things like smell. Which is why you can spend a long time with someone online, then you meet them and you're like, ugh, right? 
And the people you were supposed to meet, you didn't because they didn't fall into the right drop-down category. Um, it's really going to change the nature of evolutionary uh, development over time, online stuff, um, in my opinion. Um, not that we aren't screwed enough up already. Um, okay, so <laughs> attitudes are more than attitudes, right? So this is my kind of logic of my argument. Spouses assort on social attitudes, especially political ones. You pass on your genes. In interaction with your environment, it develops into political ideology. Um, these things are not simple. They're polygenic and multifactorial. Uh, parents create environments. People self-select into environments. Um, so why does this matter? Why should we care about this? Well, there's one big reason. Because it leads to violence. And here I don't just mean people hating each other, I mean people killing each other. And we have lots of examples, devastating examples, in the last few weeks. Cops killing black people, um, veterans and others killing cops, I mean, and wars, right? Syria, I mean, you can think about the Middle East, there's lots of places where violence becomes problematic. It's conflagration in lots of places. Where we see it, um, and we've looked into this with regard to the effect of certain emotions and the genetic contribution of emotions to pol specific political attitudes. Uh, in particular, we did a study on fear and its effect on how people uh, feel about immigration. Um, and I think a lot of you will be familiar with a lot of these arguments because of the Brexit vote in England and how the best predictor of whether or not people um, chose um, leave as opposed to remain actually had to do with um, attitudes on immigration. What we did is we said, well, you know, not everybody's the same. And what's really going on is what's driving people's attitudes on immigration is fear. And so we looked at people, um, not just their own assessment of their fear, but also um, clinically diagnosed. And then we did some um, genetic analysis as well to show differences across twins in terms of dispositional reactivity uh, to threat. And what we found is that the more conservative people are, in fact, more fearful. But because we had a genetic sample, so what you see here is those on the right, right, they're more conservative. And they show um, support for stricter immigration, uh, opposition to multiculturalism. They don't like foreign trained doctors. They don't. Um, they do like segregation. You know, these are the ways it plays out. But what was really interesting is we found that you know it's not the case that um, conservative people are more fearful. It's the case that fearful people are more conservative. So if you're scared, if you think everything is a threat you're more likely to become conservative because it, it imposes a sense of order, right? And a sense of security, a sense of stability. And that's what's really driving it, not the reverse, which are the arguments that you often see in um, uh, the press. Um, so I want to leave some time for questions. But um, because I've spent a lot of time talking about um, political uh, ideology in terms of genetics, I really want to return to a very important point, which is to say that the arguments that we began with about socialization are not wrong. They're not wrong. They're just only half of the story. And the other half of the story, which are these biological and genetic and physiological aspects, are another important part of the story. And these things intersect to create the complexity of the social world that we live in. And it has important consequences for real life policy decisions, um, including war and immigration and who you vote for and um, everyday violence. So um, I will stop there. And um, I uh, look forward to and I invite your comments and questions. and. Um, I'm perfectly happy if you object. <laughs> Let's have a big round of applause for Rose. So, so we are going to do uh, questions and answers now, and I want to let you know bef before we get started with that even, um, Rose is going to stick around afterwards, so if you don't get a chance to ask your question now, but we've got a bunch of time for it, um, we hope you'll stick around and hang out and chat with her more informally afterwards. And, buy her book and she can sign it for you and good things like that. Um, so we have a question from the live stream that I wanted to oh. uh, start off with. Sorry. You mean they can type it in? Huh? They type it in? Yeah, they type oh, it in. Yeah, and cool. I've, I've got it right here on this small uh, device. Um, so <laughs> from, from, from JBL, uh, so uh, that's LBJ, an anagram for LBJ. <laughs> I'm not sure if that means anything. Um, but uh, 
the studies, so the studies you're talking about seem to focus on left and right. And, and uh, JBL is asking, what about other aspects? Is, is it just, what about libertarians or, or, or folks that would um, identify or be, uh, be identified in, in different ways? What can you say about that? Um, that's a really, really important question. And actually, with the majority of the studies that we're doing, we're looking at the world spectrum of political behavior from left and right, meaning from communists to fascists, so not actually Republicans and Democrats. In the world political spectrum, uh, Republicans and Democrats in the United States context are this far apart. They're the same thing. They're called liberals. Right, in the world political spectrum, they're in the middle. Why is that the case? Because they both believe in things like private property, uh, capitalism, democracy, uh, you know, individualism. Both those parties believe in those things as fundamental core um, uh, constituent aspects of the government. And so they're actually, from a you know, political theory standpoint, kind of indistinguishable. Um, but many of the studies that we've done have um, the ones that I've talked about today have been more closely um, uh, looking at Republicans and Democrats in the American context, but we've done other studies that look at um, uh, world context. So we have another study where we've looked at um, five continents over 50 years, looking at the world spectrum from communist to fascist, showing uh, consistency in certain kinds of attitudes between those on the left and those on the right um, over long periods of time and quite large um, spatial regions. Those topics tend to be things like sex and reproduction, which differ reliably between the left and the right, resource allocation, think about that in terms of things like welfare, and also um, in-group um, protection and outgroup discrimination, not just things like immigration, but war, um, you know, defense, uh, draft, you know, those kinds of topics. And, and let me just follow up a little bit on that. And by the way, we, um, so Rio has a, a microphone, so if you want to ask a question, just uh, raise your hand and she'll get the mic to you to, to follow up in just a second. Um, so to follow up on that, so we're in the midst of the conservative, nothing seems more at odds than when it's convention season, right? So, so taking your point that we're all in a liberal democratic kind of uh, um, context here, how, are, how would you advise us to understand both what's happening here and what, as you pointed out, is happening in other countries? Is, is, are, are the polls getting more charged or further apart? Is that something that's, is is more seen through the media than 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 is reality. Um, are 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 the, we getting more fascistic? Is that really happening, or is that just sort of a dynamic we seem to be observing, but may not be real? Or 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 do you do you have an opinion on that? Well, you have to see who wins the election, right? Yeah. Um, I think that um, what you do see, and I, I showed it a little bit in the simulation slide, is I do think that we're getting more polarized, so that you know. Democrats and Republicans are moving a little bit more this way, but still within a liberal context. It's still hard to imagine. Um, you know, I mean, Bernie Sanders came close to having a more socialist thing, but I mean, he wasn't saying, uh, let's eliminate the military. Uh, let's, um, you know, completely socialize all aspects of, um, you know, civil society. So, I mean, it's very hard to imagine somebody with that kind of argument getting much traction, or frankly, someone you know, completely on the right saying, okay, let's get rid of democracy, we're just gonna be run by a military. You know, we're gonna put, you know, some version of, you know, Adorno in charge and, and um, we're all gonna be down with that, right? They're better at running the war than the civilians anyway, so it's okay. It's very hard to imagine. I mean, you get political leaders who used to be in the military, like Dwight Eisenhower, who can then run, but that's once they're civilians, right? The civilian control of the military is, um, old and deep in American culture and, and important given what happened just in Turkey. Like you can see that, you know, there's differences in that. So I do think you see uh, increasing polarization over time. I'd argue that in part that's a result of um, this genetic assortative mating on political ideology. But um, in a world spectrum, I still, I don't see it, you know, um, we're not quite, um, you know, in a place where either a true communist or a true fascist is likely to win the majority of the population. And even now, you know, we can be very concerned about, um, you know, or crack jokes about what the Republican National Convention is doing now, but, you know, if you run the polls, it's still not, you know, it's very close, right? It's 50-50, it's, it's not 70-30. Mm -hmm. So um, there's still contention. All right, do we have uh, right here on the second row, or there we go, there we go. 
So I found the slide showing the two police officers having the interaction with the man on the ground, mm -hmm. very interesting. Have you done any study about how that affects people's accuracy in, let's say, looking at a film of an incident and comparing that to the, in terms of what actually happened? Yeah. Um, I think that that's the really important thing to do, but the problem is is that the technology of being able to do eye tracking on moving video is very um, difficult, statistically complicated, and unspeakably expensive. So if somebody wants to give me an enormous grant, uh, <laughs> um, but it, the really what's prevented us from, conceptually, you're absolutely right, but what's prevented us is really technological and financial limitations. Um, but that is the really interesting question. Like, will it... Um, affect how they subsequently view later elements of, you know, a narrative illustration. And I think the reason, like when I think about that, the reason I think that's important is that narrative is really how you do recruitment for things like jihadist groups or, you know, right-wing Christian groups. I mean, it doesn't matter, but any kind of group that you're working using online recruitment. If you capture somebody initially, how is it that the narrative develops in a way that compels them? And that's a really important part of it. And, and I don't think we have very good work on that now, mostly because of the technological limitations. We had a question on the second row, or yeah, there we go. Can we trick the fearful to flock towards the liberal? So my joke was infants on Librium. <laughs> infants on the? Librium, give people Valium. Um, you know, put it in the water like, uh, like you use uh, with... Uh, but without drugging with. them. Can we, can we trick them through political messaging and um, re-articulating yeah. theories to be able to attract the fearful into a more liberal policy? So um, I have a couple of responses. I mean, obviously the one about drugging them is, is a joke. I really didn't mean it like fluoride. But, um, you know, uh, I do really believe that better funding for mental health care would make a really big difference in this country in lots of domains, including reducing um, fear. And I think it's not accidental that the Republicans don't want to fund that, um, not to be paranoid. Um, I think that um, the problem with overcoming fear is that evolutionarily, we're programmed to give more attention to threats because that's how we survive. There are very, very, there's a lot of things where we have one trial learning. If you eat a food that makes you really sick or alcohol that makes you really, really sick, you're just not gonna really wanna eat that again in the future because it's associated with that sickness. There are very, very few positive things in life um, where there's reinforcement. Reproduction's like the only one of them, right? Like sex, that's it. Everything else is kind of a downer, right? I mean, like when you think about it evolutionarily. And so it's very difficult to imagine a positive message. Andrew could say a lot more about hope than I can, but it's very difficult to overcome fear with hope, right? Because, you know, the, the, the imaging that you have around what could potentially, um, uh, it's, it's infinite to think about the ways in which your life could go bad. But to think about the ways it could be really great, it's more limited, right? There's an asymmetry to that, and there's evolutionary important reasons for there to be an asymmetry. That means it's very difficult to overcome. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try, um, but it's very difficult to capture people's attention. And the media makes money out of catching people's attention. And so they're not going to want to run a story that's only going to get a million people to watch it versus 20 million people who like the, you know, if it bleeds, it leads, right? Um, you, you want that kind of attention. And, and our attentional system works that way for good reason. It's just that in a modern environment, it can get us into systematic and predictable trouble, but also saves our lives, right? Um, so it's, it's complicated. But it's a very important and good question. And, and my answer with a lot of these things is unusual. You know, when <laughs> I just had to give a talk for the Department of Defense, and they said, well, where would you put your money? And I said, maternal nutrition. You know, I mean, if you actually make sure that people in utero come to believe, in, you know, chemically that they're in, entering a world of abundance and not a world of deprivation, you're going to have a really different group of people. You can imagine how well that went over. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And... Um why don't you find someone in the back of the room? I'm going to give you the, the microphone here in a second. But um, just to touch on, you, you mentioned briefly that sort of evolutionary perspective. And we talked a little bit. It wasn't the focus of your talk. But um, we've talked a little bit more about how the underlying impulses, what's being expressed now in these cultural issues here, whether it's 
transgender bathrooms or, or um, you know, in another topic of the day. C can you say a little bit more about how that traces back to kind of the long now of the, the evolutionary impulses? Yeah, so um, there's a difference between these um, long-standing motives that are evolutionarily incentivized and what we think of as the issues of the day. So how I've come to think about it by looking at this work over a long period of time is the issues that you can imagine um, made a difference for whether or not you could successfully raise your children to have children of their own fall into these basic categories, sex and reproduction. And it's not just about your own, right? It's about your desire to control other people's behavior around this. It's not good enough that like I have my own morality about what kind of sexual behavior I'm gonna engage in or not but I have very clear ideas about how you should do it, right? That's the part that, that is very interesting because that turns it from personal into political, right? So sex and reproduction, resource allocation, that means things like in an issue of the day, it might look like welfare, um, but there might be a different point in time where it looks like something else, you know? It doesn't have to necessarily be welfare. Think about sex and reproduction, you know? There's lots of ways, you know, in the 18th century it was all about, you know, pornography or you could imagine it being about prostitution and today it's about transgender bathrooms. The specific issue may differ, but it's tapping into the same latent underlying variable, right? Um, and the third one would be this issue about in-group protection and out-group defense, war, immigration, you know, you can think about it change, war is pretty constant. I actually have a really fundamental belief that we learn to cooperate in order to be able to engage in combat more successfully. There's some debate around that, but you know, I'm all over that part of it. Um, I don't think it's peace, love, and the bombs will go away, but you know, there's debate about that. Um, so you know, I think that there's these, these really pretty basic underlying issues. You can find them over time. You can find them over space. But the issue of the day, the way it may manifest, it's gonna change based on cultural factors and based on technology and a whole bunch of other things that may change over time. And um, I know Jamie's gonna give an even way more brilliant talk about this um, later than I can, but these evolutionary things, it's not every issue that's gonna have this impact. It's the issues where you can imagine that the successful resolution of that as an adaptive problem leads to you know, perceptually different outcomes in your ability to successfully raise children to their own reproductive capacity. Question. Thank you. I really appreciate your findings, um, you know, and the, the, the primal drivers of smell, that that is still so powerful. My, my hope has always been that um, education uh, would be the inoculation against tribalism. So education in terms of critical thinking skills, um, recognition of a cog a cognitive dissonance, and uh, the development of logical argumentation. <laughs> so I'm a little concerned now, <laughs> based on your findings, um, what your take on that is. And that, that relates certainly to an earlier uh, question um, that, that, you, that you addressed. But I'd love to hear your, your, your thoughts on that. I'm going to take a wild guess and, and guess that you're a liberal. <laughs> so, um, what are the odds? <laughs> um, education matters, but I would call it a necessary but completely insufficient factor. Um, and the answer I'm going to give is slightly different than um, the topic that I've been talking about, but I've spent the better part of the last 15 years studying um, practices of polygyny around the world, which is where one man has multiple wives. Um, the corollary of that is polyan when you know one woman has multiple husbands, it's rare. It never causes a problem. Um, the I mean, it's really rare. Um, Nepal, you know, a few um, random places, but it, it's really pretty rare. Um, but polygyny causes um, just an inordinate amount of consequences that are negative for women and children, and also for uh, about 50% of men. Um, you know, it reduces education. Uh, it ca you know, increases rates of sex trafficking, female genital mutilation, reduces um, longevity for men and women, increases maternal mortality, reduces interbirth interval, causes all kinds of, I mean, like, you know, it's just everything, right? Um, and when you look at it in places where it's really endemic, like Africa, and really well-meaning people from the World Bank who are liberal go in and they're just like, teach women to read, you know, give them micro accounts, it'll all be great, doesn't do shit. You make polygyny illegal, and all of a sudden, everything changes. 
this. You get economic development, you get um, uh, children living longer, you reduce child mortality by 22%. I mean, it's like a one cause factor. But like, try to get those cultures, those communities, those laws, those tribal networks to agree to that when controlling female productive and reproductive capacity is the basis not only of their status but their wealth, good luck, right? When I look at Syria and the Middle East and what's going on there, yes, there's a lot of political stuff going on. But what I see is that that's all about male dominance hierarchies and the desire to continue to control female productive and reproductive capacity. And that's what they're fighting against. And that is the East-West thing. You can lay oil on top of it and everything else, but that's really what it comes down to. That's what they're fighting for, that way of life. Um, and that's, that's the place where I'm gonna say that's worth fighting for. You know, you don't want slavery, right? I mean, of anybody by anybody. And it's not, you know, the problem with these is you think it's bad for women and it's good for men. That's not true, it's really bad for men. Because in polygamous cultures, 50% of men can't find reproductive access. They can't get wives, women to have children with, so what do they do? They fight, right? And the governments know they fight. And so the government's like, well, better you fight them than me. I don't want to be decapitated by you. So I'm going to form an army and fight you so that I can kill all these surplus men, preserve my hierarchy. Um, and I don't care who else I'm going to kill, because as long as it's not me, right, Assad, as long as it's not me, I'm down with it, right? So that's, you know, it's a very unusual way to look at it. Richard Wrangham's <laughs> ideas, right, these aren't mine. Um, but I, I really do believe, um, you know, we, we have a database that we've spent the last 15 years putting up on the web called womenstats.org. Any of you can go up to it. It's on the, for up, um, up free on the web. We have about 320 variables now for each of 170 countries on facts related to women and children. And you can pull it down either by country or by topic. And you start poking around in that, and it's pretty convincing. Uh, Rio, do you have another? Great. There we go. Please. So, first of all, this is a wonderful talk. I come here for thought-provoking talks, and this has completely blown my mind. It's been awesome. So, Life from Planet uh, Pluto. Yeah, so <laughs> thank you. Um, I thought the place that you started was really interesting of the, uh, the correlation between olfactory compatibility and political compatibility, and I just couldn't figure out how did you into it that place to start, and could you just say a bit more about that? Um, so the place that I intuited, the place to start, can I, how sure, do I go all I'll the way uh, back? I'll do it. Um, it. It's a sort of long, complicated story. The smell, the smell study came late in a lot of the work that we've been doing on genetics, so I don't mean to imply in any way, shape, or form that this is where I started. Um, where I'm going from this, by the way, is taste. My next study is really going to be about taste because I think that um, we undervalue somatic realities. Um, and you say to me, how are you going to do that? Well, that's what kissing is about, assessing genetic fitness. Um, so, um, I, I would love a copy um, of that study, by the way. I haven't done it yet. <laughs> <laughs> but by the way, um, I so know it's going to turn out. And it will be the first study in my life where I'm not my own first subject. <laughs> um, so this is how we intuited it. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail because you asked. Um, as I said, we've done these a number of studies um, over a period of time. And the earlier studies were really looking at genome-wide association for political ideology to say, is there a genetic difference um, on political ideology. And here I want to be really, really clear because of the earlier question from the person online. I really don't mean political party identification. I don't mean Republican and, and Democrat. I mean liberal and um, conservative in the, well, actually, you know, communist and fascist in the world sense. And when you get a lot of those people, and when I say a lot, these studies involve 100,000 people or more. These are not trivial numbers of people, and they often involve twins. Um, and when you look at them, you can run for, you know, each chromosome, and here you see, you know, chromosome 1 through 22, and we know from other people's work that's not about politics, um, in general, what each of these chromosomes tap into. Because these are very large studies and extremely small effects, each little genetic thing is very small, and that's why you need hundreds of thousands of people 
That's why a lot of this work has only been done recently is because, you know, as recently as 10 years ago, it would take you two weeks to run one person's genome. Right now you can do many, many hundred a day, but that's why the, the field is moving much more quickly now. Because the effects are small, there's going to be a lot of random noise. So the, the standard cutoff, and this is in disease, it's in all kinds of work, it's not just the kind of work we do. The, the idea is like, okay, if it's above, you know, 2 times 10 to the 8th, maybe, but if it's above 3, that's something's really going on. So when we took all the earlier studies we had done on political ideology and ran them to see what things are associated at above this cutoff point for significance um, with political ideology, starting Dust Bowl empiricism, we have no idea. All of a sudden, it's like, wow, it's an MDA. It's, it's you know, GPR. It's these things that we know from other people's work having nothing to do with politics is about smell, is about olfaction. So then, now, and you know, I want to be honest, the person that I coerced into doing the statistics for this study was, you know, this brilliant junior colleague of mine. And I said, you know, it's, if it's a miss, it's going to be a big miss, but nobody will know. But if it's a hit, it's going to be a big hit. He says, you're really wacky, Rose, but I owe you. So he never thought in a million years it would work out. So when it did, he was shocked, right? And by the way, he also threw up when he smelled 190. Um, <laughs> so he was a liberal guy smelling a conservative guy. Um, but these, these, every single one of those factors, with one of them is related to taste. That's why I'm going there. But the other ones are really related to smell. And so the question that we really started with is, how is it that people don't know they're selecting on politics, but the people where there's really long-term successful mating are selecting on politics? What's really going on is deselection. And so what is making you deselect? And it's these, you know, unconscious, automatic things, because we're not smart, but evolution is brilliant, right? We're talking about neurocomputational capacity over millennial time. And it knows you're stupid. You're going to do things sexually that aren't in your best interest, <laughs> right? But it also knows that it can make you a little smarter. And it only has to do it at a nanogram to increase, you know, survival over millennial time. And it does it by making it not hard. You just kind of don't smell good to me. So the other capacity, the other thing that this is related to, why we got this intuition, is the original work that was done on, on t-shirts was really about immune system. So everybody has an immune system, the major histocompatibility complex, and there's very well-established work showing that you, that people don't like the smell of people whose immune systems are similar to theirs. They like the smell of somebody whose immune system is different than theirs. So why is that? Well, because pathogens work faster than humans. They have life cycles that are much more, you know, we live too many years, um, and, you know, uh, bacteria transform, you know, 24 hours. So your kids are going to have much more likelihood of survival if your immune systems um, are not overlapping, if you have a broader spectrum. That's why there's, um, you know, this, this kind of hidden phenomenon of women who are on the pill, which affects these kinds of things. And, you know, then you go off the pill because you want to get pregnant, and all of a sudden you actually really don't like the smell of the person you're with. That's a lot of immune system stuff. Um, so, you know, evolution makes it, in some sense, easy, automatic, inferential. Um, and so the question for us was, well, if it can do that on immune system, it probably can do it in political ideology, but it's hard to think about how that would happen with a similar mechanism, because in one case, you want somebody who's really different than you on immune system, but really similar to you on ideology, but it's happening through the same mechanism of smell, right? And there's complicated reasons why we think that works, and you can read the paper. Um, you won't want to, but you can. Um, and, um, you know, we go into it, but, but that was basically the theoretical inspiration and the empirical motivation for uh, undertaking smell. All right, so we're going we're gonna to have to uh, stop there. Rose is going to stick around. Please stick around. Keep asking questions. You're, you're able to stay for, yeah. for a bit, right? Yeah. Um, I, I want to ask you one more quick thing, actually. Let me uh, skip to the end. Tell us briefly about the book that's here. You're co-editor of... Uh, this book, oh, right. right? Do you want so, to tell people? Um, this book, um, it's a little old. It's two or three years old, um, and I edited it with my primary collaborator, Peter Tommy, the person I mentioned at the outset, who's at Penn State. And it's a collection of essays, but we actually wrote about a third of the book. So we wrote the theoretical chapter, the introduction, the conclusion. I wrote a chapter on hormones. Um, but there's other really major players who've also contributed chapters. There's a, a chapter I love on um, uh, chimps by... Um, uh, 
uh, Sarah Brosnan that looks at you know, the, the way in which we overlap with um, other primates on some of these political factors. Um, you know, she, she's the one who did that great study showing that um, chimps will go on hunger strike if some of them get grapes and some of them get cucumbers. Um, you know, they, they have a really strong sense of fairness and equity, um, sometimes better than humans, well, always better than humans. Um, <laughs> And so, um, you know, there's, there's a sequence of other chapters in it. Um, I suggested it because it's the most um, comprehensive um, uh, volume that combines a lot of these different kinds of contributions. And like I said, it's not all mine, but, um, you know, we did write about a third of it. And then the other contributions, I think, are um, really pretty strong as well. Right. It's uh, University of Chicago. Right. And we've got, we've got them in the back uh, if you'd like to pick one up tonight. Rose, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to give you, uh, this is a long now challenge coin, oh. as a <laughs> little thank you for, for speaking for us tonight. Let's have a big round of applause.